Thank you so much. The power of the cross. You know, the cross really looked like weakness, didn't it? It looked like defeat. But it was a powerful invasion of the God of this universe that uh, came in to drive out a foreign invader. And that foreign invader was much worse than the disease that has invaded our city and invaded our country. That foreign invader was sin itself. And I want to talk to you from Genesis chapter 4. I want to speak to you about an evil invasion. You know, life on this planet is lived under the curse of sin. And man... When he fell in that Garden of Eden, triggered a horrendous downward spiral. You read the history books and the science books that are published today, and if you get the viewpoint of historians and anthropologists, you'll find that they completely ignore the fall. And so they have to come up, they have to conjure up a totally skewed theory of evolution, of human development, that they say starts with, uh, of course, amoeba, but in human development, the caveman to where we are in the present. Genesis 4, where I've had you turn, gives us a correct historical account, and it tells us what happened to our world. And it tells us the progress of sin and the development of it. And I'd like to share that with you from this fourth chapter. Because this is what necessitates Palm Sunday, as it's called. This is what necessitates the cross. This is why Jesus had to come. There has been a foreign invasion into human life, and it's sin. And sin has progressed, and sin has developed from what we see here in chapter 4 of Genesis, both on a personal level in the life of Cain, and then on a cultural level in the life of his descendants. And of course, here we are today. Let's pause a moment, look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you did not choose to live, to, to leave fallen man in their cursed condition. We're so grateful that you have come up with a plan we call salvation, a plan of redemption, a plan whereby we are rescued, a plan uh, through which we are set apart to you from all else that has been plundered. Father, we pray today that you'll use the message from this passage to touch every heart, to accomplish your purpose in every life. We want Jesus to be glorified. He's the only worthy one. May people see him and hide me in that shadow of the person and the cross of the Lord Jesus. I pray it in his name. Amen. So I want to talk about the personal level in which this invasion of evil, of sin, has crept in as we look at Cain's life in Genesis chapter 4. And you're going to find that uh, Cain was very typical of human life. He was a man that basically did his own thing. He was a man that, uh, that uh, did what he wanted to do, and as a result, as all people do when they live that way, made a huge mess of his life. And of course, he impacted his family members too. In fact, look at how this invasion of evil impacted his family. Genesis chapter 4, I've had you turn to it. Uh, verse 1, Adam knew his wife. She conceived, bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. Here we see that uh, uh, there is a family that is being built. And building a family is not only to have children. 
that's not the only purpose of marriage. Uh, marriage is blessed with children, but some marriages aren't blessed with children. But children are a precious gift from the Lord. We see God giving that to, to both Adam and Eve. Gives them two boys, Cain and then Abel. Cain, his name, Cain, from the word Kanya, which means to get. And so she says, Eve, I have gotten a man from the Lord. In other words, she sees this child as a gift from God. And perhaps there is even in that statement of Eve a piece of faith in which, in which she is linking her hope to that promise that was given to her when God spoke to the serpent that curse that he would, uh, through the seed of the woman, he would bruise the head of the serpent. And perhaps she thought this might be that very answer. That might be the man. That might be the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent's head. Basically, in the fact that she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord, she realizes a lot uh, there that many people don't, and that is that life comes from God. Life doesn't spring out of nothing. Life uh, doesn't evolve. Life comes from God. I've gotten a man from the Lord. And then she had a second child, another boy. His name was Abel. And uh, Abel's name means breath. It's the same word that is used so often in the book of the Ecclesiastes translated vanity. Breath. In other words, I think she realized that life, since sin invaded it, Life had vanity, and it was brief. You know, sin created a lot of dysfunction in this world, but it is no more pronounced than it is in these early verses in Genesis chapter 4. The dysfunction that sin has brought to the family is just uh, astounding. There's so much dysfunction here from the very beginning of the family we see terrible fracture. The kind of stuff that only God can deal with. You got family problems today? It goes way back here. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3. It's seen here in Genesis chapter 4. You got family problems. You have a fractured family. This is where it comes from. It's an invasion of evil that has come into this earth as a result of the sin of uh, our original parents. And God can deal with it. And God can heal it. And I want to give you that kind of hope. But this invasion of sin on the personal level not only affected Cain's family, but it was an invasion even into his work, his labor. Look at the second part of verse 2. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know, God ordained that human beings work. It's abnormal for people not to work. Now, there are exceptions when people cannot work, but God dignified work because he put Adam in the garden before sin even entered the world as a worker. It was his job to take care. He was the gardener. He was the keeper of that garden. And so God dignifies work. And, uh, but work is not just to pay bills and to provide our needs. Work, when it's viewed from God's viewpoint, is that we get the privilege of co-laboring with God, of cooperating with God, to use the creative gifts that he has blessed each one of us with for both the good of others and for the glory of God. And if that's not the focus of our work, what happens is then we begin to focus on money, we begin to focus on things, and we forget that it all has come from him. He gives the wisdom, he gives the strength, he gives the ability 
to work and to get gain. There's a third area on the personal level that evil invaded in this man Cain's life. Not only in family life and in labor or work, but also in the area of faith. Look at verse 3. It says in Genesis 4, 3, And in due time, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. He was a farmer. And uh, so he brought some of his crops as an offering to God. And verse 4 says, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. He was a shepherd. And the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. He was angry. And his countenance fell, frowned. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, uh, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. They brought an offering to the Lord. Let me remind us that God has created human beings to worship. We're created to worship him. We're created for worship. But worship is expressed in a dependent, loving relationship with God. And it becomes false worship. It becomes a man-made worship. It becomes idolatry whenever we substitute anything for that dependent relationship upon God. Now, you'll note in the verses that we've just read, in verses uh, uh, 4 and, uh, and the following, that God, it says, did not have respect for Cain's offering. In other words, God didn't smile upon what Cain brought. He wasn't pleased with it. He didn't gaze on it with favor. And I think that that is a primary reference not to what Cain brought, but to Cain who was offering that offering. It was a reference to the heart of the offerer. Because the value of anything that we present to God is based upon having a right heart when we do that. You don't worship the Lord if you don't have a right heart with the Lord. You can go through the motions. You can look as if you're worshiping the Lord. You can go uh, to church on Palm Sunday, and you can get your palm drawn, and you can, uh, you can uh, wave it around, and you can pretend that you're worshiping, but if your heart's not right with God, it's not worship. It's the heart of the matter. And there is a huge difference between a relationship that is dependent uh, totally upon God for spiritual life and religion. Palm Sunday, great, if it's real worship. But for the most part, when I look at religion and uh, their uh, their worship on special days during the year, I see it all as just a ritual. I see it all as just external. I don't think it's real if it's just one day out of the year like this. And so it's really about a personal relationship with the Lord. Do you have that? Are you just going through the, worship, uh, the motions of worship? Are you just pretending to worship God? Are you just doing... What comes natural? Are you just doing what you've been taught all your life? Whether it be uh, through a rabbi or a priest or a minister? Or do you have a personal heart relationship with the Lord? Because that's what matters. That's why God did not look with favor upon the offering of Abel. It wasn't because he didn't bring him what God wanted. It was because his heart wasn't right with God. It wasn't a heart relationship. It was just religion. In fact, when we read what the book of Hebrews says, 
The commentary on this is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel brought to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. A more excellent, he brought the best because Abel was seeking from a right heart to truly please God. And so he was bringing to God the firstling of the flock and the fat of the offering. In other words, the best that he had, he was bringing to God because his heart was set on pleasing God. It wasn't just, okay, here's what I got, you know, and I'm going to give it to God uh, as an offering. No, it wasn't ritualistic with Abel. It was a heart giving its best to the Lord. In fact, again, Hebrew says, by faith, he offered a more excellent sacrifice. In other words, the basis for a relationship with God and acceptance with God is not by bringing him offerings. It's not by doing good deeds. It's not by mitzvah. The basis for having a relationship and acceptance with God is one and only way, and that is by faith, as Abel, by faith. What is faith? Faith is total dependence upon God. You're not depending upon what you can do at all in order to gain God's favor, in order to have God's acceptance. You don't come to church on Palm Sunday because you want to you get some points with God. No, it's by faith. It's a heart dependence upon God, real worship. It's responding to God by just submitting your whole heart to him versus fake worship, I guess we could call it. Come to God on man-made terms. That's what this invasion of evil does to faith. It makes it phony. It makes it hypocritical and unreal. And I want you to see the reaction because God did not look with favor upon a, uh, Cain's offering. Look at the reaction of Cain in uh, the second part of verse 5. Cain was very angry. He had a burning anger, and he was frowning now. His face fell. His countenance fell. He was angry, and you could see it. It was written all over his face. He was bitter. He's bitter. And look at how God graciously tries to lead him back to real, genuine faith and warns him about the sin of bitterness in his heart. It's a very powerful picture. Look at what he says to him. He first of all confronts him with questions. Isn't that how God confronted Adam and Eve? A couple questions. That's to get our attention and to lead us to a guilty conscience. Guilty conscience, when it's rightly guilty, can be remedied. And look at what happens here. God says, why are you angry? Why does your face look like that? Verse 7. If you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, here's a warning. I said it's a powerful picture. Sin is like a wild animal crouched, ready to pounce on and devour its prey. Sin is at the door of the life. You better not open the door to it, Cain. That's what he said. Keep the door tightly shut. Don't open the door to sin that is ready to pounce. Does he take God's warning? Well, look with me, if you will, at verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him, killed him, murdered him. He's a murderer. A bitter heart. A bitter heart will always prevent real worship. It will destroy fellowship with God. You can't worship God if you have bitterness in your heart towards someone. You can't worship God. It will destroy your fellowship with him, and it will destroy your fellowship with other believers as well. And I think it's significant because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus equates 
a bitter, murderous heart as being equal to carrying out murder with your hand. Matthew 5 and verse 21. If you're bitter towards your brother, and I'm talking to believers in particular here, if you're bitter towards the brethren, anyone, then I'm telling you, you are empty of God's love. I'm not saying if you're a believer, you're not saved. But I'm saying if you are bitter towards your brother, you are empty of God's love. And I say that not on the basis of my personal opinion, but I say that on the basis of the Word of God itself. Uh, we read in 1 John 3, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother is righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. See that? Hate in the heart is equivalent with murder in God's eyes. There are people that if the church was open today would not be present in the service because they have hate in their heart towards other believers. And they're empty of God's love. As a result and uh, uh, interesting to me that this murder follows Cain's offering to the Lord what does that tell you about his worship he goes about the motions of worshiping God by giving God an offering and then turns around and kills his brother that tells me his worship wasn't real to begin with that tells me that it was fake he had an evil heart and uh, it was untouched and it was unchanged. He was not serious about worshiping God. And when God confronts him with those questions, he's very evasive and he lies. Where's your brother? I don't know. God confronts him with questions in order to give him an opportunity to get right, to confess his sin, and as a result then to experience God's mercy. And God's forgiveness. You know, God can forgive murderers. I know of a serial killer that has been forgiven of God and, and is growing in the Lord as a result of getting God's forgiveness and enjoying God's mercy. And if you don't believe that murderers can be forgiven by God, you don't know God. You don't know Him. You don't know how forgiving He is. You should realize that there is no sin that God can't forgive except the rejection of him, the unbelief. He says to this man, Cain, in verse 10, What hast thou done? Isn't that a good question? What have you done? That's a good question to ask ourselves. What have I done? That's a good question to ask people, maybe our children, Lord, what have you done? Get them to admit. What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God says, I hear your brother's blood that was soaked up by the ground crying out to me. Innocent blood. Innocent blood pollutes the land and cries out for God's judgment. Let that be a warning to every abortionist. Let that be a warning to everyone that would shed innocent blood, that the blood of innocence cries out to God for his judgment. That's what God said about the blood of Abel that was shed by his brother Cain. And I think about that, and I think about what cries out better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel, according to God's own word, cries out for God's judgment, God's vengeance upon it. 
but the blood of Jesus that was shed by wicked and lawless hands cries out forgiveness and mercy. It cries out better things than the blood of evil. Hey, you need the cleansing blood of Jesus in your heart and life today if you've never received it. He can cleanse. He can wash. If he can forgive a murderer, he can forgive you. And he's holding out hope to this man. Look at what he says in verses 11 and 12. Now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it will not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Okay, so he's not repentant. He's cursed. He defiled the ground. And as a result, the ground will never produce for him, the farmer that he was. And he's forced to be a fugitive, to run from home. He's forced to be a vagabond all his life without a home. But God doesn't leave him hanging. Look at verse 13. God, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Isn't it interesting that he's more concerned about the severity of his punishment than the severity of his sin? doesn't see his sin is serious, but he sees the punishment is serious. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day, verse 14, from the face of the earth, and from the face, uh, uh, from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every man that findeth me shall slay me. He's worried about his life not being taken. What does God say to him? Verse 15, the Lord said, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. You know what I see in that 15th verse? Mercy. Cursed, verses 13 and 14, because he's unrepentant. But mercy in that 15th verse. Here he is whining in his fear. And God meets that whining fear with a promise that will guarantee him to be protected. And during that period in which he would not be killed, but protected by God, is a golden opportunity for him over and over again to repent. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is the personal invasion of evil into a life. But I want you to see in closing the cultural level in which this evil has invaded. Beginning with the 16th verse, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So sin perpetrated, evil invades and permeates. It begins with an individual Cain and eventually pollutes the entire culture and civilization. And it led to, first of all, in verse 16, a departure. Not just condemned to endless wandering Cain, but the saddest part of the curse is that he's going to be separated from God. He went out from the presence of the Lord do you know that that is the history of civilization? Humanity went out from the presence of the Lord. We're separated from God. That's our natural condition that we're born into. The Bible says that. And you read the book of Romans, and in the very first chapter, you find that there were civilizations that knew God. But because they did not glorify Him as God, but became vain in their thinking, proud in their thoughts, didn't think they needed God. God gave them over, and God gave them up to what they wanted to do. That's one of the most fearful things that God can do to a people, to a nation, to a civilization, to a culture. But that's what we see happening in this chapter. It's a great departure, and it develops. In verse 17, and Cain, who his wife, she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. And he and uh, Cain 
he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. I want you to note this. There is here really the beginning of civilization, the beginning of culture. And what you're going to find is when you're separated from God as a people, you become addicted to worldly things that will never satisfy anyone. And uh, you'll do all that you can to make your existence attractive through cultural development, all without God. I'm all for cultural development, but with God in the center. When God is outside of civilization and culture, it becomes perverse. Look at the kind of things that are called art. Because God's not in it. And man's creativity has become perverted in many cases. But look at the, the, the development on the cultural level of this invasion of evil. First of all, in verse 17, there is the building of a city. Now, don't think of New York City. Uh, the city is very primitive. It's, it's just uh, a wall, an enclosure with some houses inside of it. That would be a village. That would be a city. But the point is this. All they have to show with it, when there's the departure from God, all they have to show for it, all they have to live for, is an earthly city. He names that city after his first son, Enoch, which uh, means dedication or beginning. And uh, perhaps it's indicative of the fact that Cain wants to start a new life through his son. And this is a proud uh, uh, perpetuating or a memorializing of his personal uh, uh, and uh, his human accomplishments. He's on his own. He builds a city. Notice what else. Verse 18. And Enoch, his son, he had a son, was born Erod. And Erod begat Mahuyael. And he begat Methuselah. And Methuselah begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Now note here beginning in verse 19. The name of one, Ada. The name of the other, Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal. And he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and, of, and uh, as such as have cattle. His brother's name, Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ, of the lyre and the flute. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artisan in brass and iron. Verse 23, Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. I want you to look at the occupants of this city that Cain began to build. Actually, what you have here is six generations of Cain's descendants. I don't know if you noted that. Lamech is the last one in the chain, and he is the first bigamist. Two wives he takes. He's also an arrogant killer. He says he did it in self-defense, but he's rejoicing in his, in his prowess to kill. He imagines himself, of course, as better than his forefather Cain, his ancestor Cain. He feels that he's more advanced, he deserves more than he did, as he boasts in verse 24. What we see, I think, is just a progressive arrogance that is the result of the invasion of evil. And then uh, verses 20 to 22, I'm not going to read them again, but you have a whole bunch of different uh, areas of employment. You have a cattle rancher, you have manufacturing, you have metalworking, perhaps the making of utensils and, and uh, building instruments, a rich cultural civilization. You have uh, manufacturing and industry and agriculture and arts and crafts, everything but God. Everything but God. Technically advanced, 
but completely moral failures. In fact, so much so that by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, God's going to take all of that Cainite descendants and wipe them out in a universal flood. I don't think it's true, but I read of two brothers that uh, were accused of stealing sheep, and they were convicted. And one of their punishment was that they had branded in their foreheads the letters S-T for sheep thief. The one couldn't bear it, and he just went off and lived his life eventually died. The other one, he hung around, and he got right about it, and he made something of his life, and uh, toward the end of his life, when he was an old man, some stranger came into town and saw those initials stamped on his forehead and asked one of the townspeople, what does that stand for, S-T? He said, I don't know goes back a long way. I think it means, I think it's an abbreviation for saint. You know, Cain was a marked man. Not in the same way. I don't believe it was a literal mark on his, on his body. But Cain was a marked man by God who first, like his brother, uh, brought an offering to God. But as I said earlier, when his offering was not accepted because his heart wasn't right with God, he never thought about the severity of his, punish, uh, of his sin, but only the severity of his punishment. He didn't realize that the brand, you might say, that God that marked him with was an act of mercy and not just a curse. God granted this man, Cain, an opportunity to repent, to repent of his sins. You know, uh, uh, if you have messed up your life, if you've had a bad beginning, you don't have to end that way. There's hope. You know, unlike Cain, you can repent. Unlike Cain, you can have a change of heart. You can ask God to forgive you, and there'll be forgiveness for you. Look, there's no one that God can't forgive. I don't even need to know what you did. You tell God. You ask God to forgive your sin. You invite him who paid the whole price that your sin deserved his judgment. He took that judgment upon himself. You invite him and his forgiveness. You ask him to be your savior. He'll save your soul. He'll give you eternal life. And your end will be very different from your beginning. You know what sin is? In essence, I think sin is simply... Life without God. And if you're a believer, the essence of sin in a believing life is life without God in the center of it. Every Christian has God, but is he in the center? Is he the one that you truly live for? Or are you living for yourself? Let's close it. Thank you, Father. I don't know who might be listening today that has never been saved, but I pray if there are people listening in that need your forgiveness of sin and want you to be their Savior, may they believe that Jesus went to that tree, he hung on that wood as the payment price for their personal guilt and sin. May they believe that he was making an atonement for them, that his blood was shed so that their sins could be washed away, and that they can have a clean slate, and that they can have a life that is completely changed, a changed heart, changed from the inside, that reveals itself in the way that we live. So Lord, I pray for people like that today, and, and believers that perhaps have bitterness in their heart and thus are empty of the love of God, I pray that they would come to admit that, recognize that, confess that, and then 
know that you're faithful and just to forgive them their sin and to cleanse them by that precious blood from all unrighteousness. Lord, draw us to yourself as true worshipers, as able, and thank you for that blood of Jesus that speaketh better things, things of forgiveness and mercy. We pray for his sake.